We are here live at the basement of a bank, folks. Here beneath the city, far away from the gunfire of West Baltimore. I am the coach, Pete Ivner, and this is the co-coach, Adam the Miz Mizell, and we are off the crossbar. And we are here to talk about all things Baltimore soccer. We're back from the beach. I'm back from hanging out in the sand with my thong on, walking around, surfing the big waves. He's back from jet skiing all around the world, hanging around celebrities, and making the world a better place for humanity. What do you got to say, Miz? Great summer, wasn't it? I mean, how was your summer? Everything good? My summer was absolutely fantastic. I got to hang out with my family. I got to surf quite a bit. And guess what else I did? What'd you do? I played in the over 50 tournament with DeSantis's this summer. They still have, they have over 50. Over 50. And let me tell you something. I got to play with legends like Sam Mangione, Nick Mangione, mm. Chris Reef, uh, Joe Barger. It was a who's who of Baltimore soccer on the field. Lee Tishantre, who, by the way, might be over 50, but I've never seen anybody run as much as this man runs. It was nonstop. Baltimore Hall of Fame soccer legend Mike Rayborg in the goal, Steve Zerhusen. It was just it, it, Brian Hartlove. It was a who's who. I'm going to go out on a limb. I know a lot of those guys. I'm going to go out on a limb and just assume that you weren't the only bald guy. I was not. The only bald guy. There were quite a few. Lee Tashantre being one of it. It was you could go through the list. It was just unbelievable. It was so much fun. But let me tell you something. It changes. Three games, two days. Mm. I was hurting, boy. It's rough. My back was jacked up. I can believe it. I was I was hurting. So you know what I had to do? Did you call Adam Maddox? I called Adam Maddox. You know what he did? Smart move. He gave me one of these, one of those. Had the gun where it was. My back lined up. Within two days, I was feeling great. I start off looking like, uh, you ever seen the movie Big Fish? Big Fish, no. You got to see the movie Big Fish. Look at that guy. That's what I look like after the game. Wow. I mean, that's, that's some serious back work he needed to do for you then. And some reason my face got contorted too. I don't know what that was about, but I'm here, I'm healthy, I'm happy. Tell us about what we got on the show today, Miz. Well, we're gonna talk a little international soccer. We got a special guest in today from more local stuff. Uh, he's gonna tell you about his program and, and uh, his subscription-based thing that he does for the folks, not just soccer, but all sports. Uh, and then we're gonna talk some local stuff and, and you know, always finish strong with our favorite part of the show. Patrick Swayze. Player of the Week. We are off the crossbar, and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. This is the coach, Pete Eibner, to talk about my company, Fast Forward Training Systems. We develop kids with the ball, make them better soccer players, increase their technical skill, increase their speed of play, and yes, we also do strength, speed, and agility. We've been in business since 1991. We've gotten over 500 kids to the Division I level in college. We have trained the best in the area. Would love to train you. So let's get out. Let's kick the ball around. Visit the website, www.fastforwardtrainingsystems.com. Welcome back to Off the Crossbar. Now it's time for one of our signature bits, signature segments. One of my favorites always because we have one of the most creative people in the world sitting right here. This, inside this dome, inside this melon, there is all kinds of things working. And so he comes up with a question of the day, the mystery question of the day. I don't know what it's gonna be. It could be about soccer. It could be about NAS NASCAR. It could be about midget wrestling. Who knows what's inside this man's brain? Miz, tell him what you got. First of all, I have a tier one joke I wanna lay on you. Go ahead. I was thinking about this earlier when you said basement of a bank, and we've been, you know, we haven't done the show in months. I was thinking if if the viewers are going through withdrawal. Right. Uh, you get, uh, no. Withdrawal, because it's a bank! I mean, what, Look inside I mean, that I mean, mine! I mean, it's, I just, you know, what do you think? I, mean, I love it. Try the veal. I, mean, what is, I love you know, it. You're ready for the prime I'm time. Right. All right. Call That's the my, comedy factory. That's my warm up. Okay, so the misery question of the week is is one that has nothing to do with soccer. The vehicle I drive has a windshield that's at kind of like at a, 
a steeper angle than most probably. It's not as aerodynamic. So I take a lot of bugs, right? Um, when you drive through the city and the guys come out and they wash your wind, I mean, they really got to put the work in on my windshield. And I always let them do it because it's, it's great. It's fantastic. It does way better than the wipers. But what is a fair price for that? What is a fair tip to give when my windshield is really, really buggy and maybe someone else's is not? I don't know if, if is there a flat rate or, I mean, what is the, uh, what's the fair price there? I need help there. Well, first of all, you heard it here first, the Miz, big fan of the squeegee kid. Big fan of the squeegee kid. The Ives, the coach, not as much because I don't like people approaching me, whether they have a squeegee or, or a, a baseball bat or whatever. I don't like them approaching my car. So I kind of go with the, I am giving you money to go away. And I don't know what the fair price is to make somebody go away, but I'm going to say $5 is a, is a go away. But if, if you're actually just going to, 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 if they squeegee it, it's just eh, three to five. Three to five? Okay. Three I did five bucks, but because, you know, again, my windshield, it was very, very buggy. I mean, I had mosquitoes on there. They were huge. A couple looked like Godzilla. I don't know. It was crazy. You look like the, the like remember in the in the movie uh, uh, Me Myself and Irene when he's on the motorcycle, yes, the bugs are hitting. Exactly. That's, that's what how, your windshield looks like. That's how my windshield looks. Yep. That's what. Okay. Well, listen. Here's the deal. You pay the squeegee kid. You have to. Here's why. Because if you don't, you might find your paint job damaged. You might get your car kicked. You might get, you, you might get, you, you don't know what's going to happen. It could be a potpourri of madness. It could be. And I will say, for the record, um, if a guy was walking to my car with a Louisville Slugger versus the Squeegee, I might be apt to throw him 10 bucks. Yeah, to, 10 bucks. <laughs> you heard it here first, Squeegee kids. The Miz will pay more for baseball bats. Because that's the way he rolls. Miz, you know something? What's that? I told you about my summer. I told you about the sand. I told you about the surf. I told you about the thong. You know what I didn't do? What's that? I didn't ask you how your summer went. How was your summer, brother? Summer was pretty good. Um, got to go to a, cool, a couple cool places um, and visit some good people, hung out with family, hung out with friends. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was nice. You know what else this man did? This man took his club team, Baltimore Celtic, to the national championship finals. Mm. Unbelievable run. You guys were state cup champions, right? Correct. Regional champions, right? Yep. And then got all the way to the final game. Tell us about how that team was. Give me, give me the update. So we got to the Nationals. We already had qualified through the National League, so it was kind of easy to just, you know, bag everything else and come out with half effort. But, you know, credit to the kids. They, they didn't want to do that. They really wanted to try to win a state cup, win a regional championship. They were able to do that, which was great. Uh, we got to the Nationals where it's, the margin of error is very thin, and you know we, we did well in the group. Uh, we advanced in the semifinal where we played, I thought, our worst game of the week uh, against uh, FC Dallas, but we were able to, to figure that out. At the end, it was, uh, was kind of dicey. They had us on our heels. But uh, then we got to the final, and uh, I thought we played well. I mean, it, there was nothing else we could have asked of the kids, and we just didn't get the finishing we needed, and you know we gave up a goal in overtime, and we lost. But... Um, like I told the kids, I wouldn't let a trophy define us as men, as competitors, and uh, we, you know, we wish them well in their college career, and, and I track the kids and, and hopefully catch up with them, and I still stay connected with them, so it's nice. They've all aged out now, so their club careers are over. Who are the key guys? Who were who are some of the players that helped you to, to get on this run? Because, man, I tell you what, I was, I was following it, and, uh, man, it couldn't be any prouder of what you guys did. That was just such a phenomenal season. Yeah, so it starts in the back. Our goalkeeper, Kieran Basket, who's now at William & Mary, um, it's just phenomenal. Uh, he has all the tools to play at whatever level he wants to play. Uh, and then in front of him, we had, you know, outstanding outside backs uh, with Braden Wise uh, and Luke Briggs. And then in the middle, we had Brandon Knapp and, and Shawnee Nolan, who just were fantastic all week uh, and for that whole run. And then in the middle of the park, we had Drags and um, Matthew Lala, who's at Loyola. Drags went to Villanova. Um, Luke Davis, who we lost after in June because he went in the Navy, but he was key for us. Uh, and then we had like some attackers up top that would score for us, Jason Butler and, and John Peterson. 
Um, and, and there's a call. There's a lot of other guys that chipped in, and it just it was a great team effort. It really was. And the kids just the, the bigger thing was they just enjoyed being around each other. It was great. Right. One of the things that I, I, I and I didn't I didn't you know, wasn't there, but what I heard about your team is that. You could sub kids in, and there was never any drop off. Every kid just came in and worked and worked and worked and worked for that that goal, that that carrot, and uh, and and that's a that that's a phenomenal compliment coming from other people. That you have a team, you know, I don't know how many you had sixteen guys, eighteen guys, twenty one guys, it doesn't matter. As long as you have guys that are all bought in, tell us a little bit about that. So we had, yeah, we were very fortunate on the roster we had. We had guys who really wanted to play for each other. So when we would make substitutions, the guys that were coming in, they didn't want to let the other guys down. So they really raised their level to try to match, you know, the, the guys that were on the field before them. And, um, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have asked any more for, uh, of the kids. And I'll tell you what, the, the, the bigger picture thing for me was when you're at the Nationals, it's like it's, it's you against the world sort of thing. Um, because all the other clubs in the country are there, and they have their teams, and they have their you know fans and all that. But uh, from our perspective, it's like the collective Baltimore groups come together. Right. You know, all the clubs go to each other's games. They cheer for each other. When a kid scores a goal, I mean, there's millions of social media video posts about it. Kids run into the corner. They all tackle each other. It's total mayhem. You, there, there's no way to, to replicate that around. It's just you can't do it. It's, uh, it's something that's very special. The kids will never forget. Very cool. Very cool. And you had to withstand the heat of West Virginia. I, I heard it was like 5,000 degrees. Yeah, the regionals were tough. It was hot. Um, the one day we played a seven-hour game, the longest game I've ever been a part of. We had three lightning delays, and one of them was three hours long. So uh, it was tough to kind of come back. And that was the semifinal. So it was, it was tough to kind of come back and get everybody loosened back up and then get back into the flow of things. But we were able to figure it out. It was good. This is why he is the co-coach Adam the Miz Mizell. He takes teams, trains kids, makes them better. Really proud of you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Credit to the kids, though. I mean, the kids are the ones who make it happen. I don't make plays. I just stand there, yell at them, and look pretty, and um, the, the rest of it's up to them. So credit to them. Awesome stuff. We are off the crossbar, and we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. A while back, I had a lot of problems with my lower back. It started with a muscle called my piriformis. And when that locked up, my lower back locked up. I couldn't coach, I couldn't run, almost couldn't walk. I went to see Dr. Adam Maddox at Ideal Health Chiropractic, and within three sessions, I'm back on the soccer field. I'm able to run, I'm able to lift weights, I'm able to train, I'm able to compete. And not only is he a sponsor of the show, but he's a really, really good guy. I consider him a friend. Check him out if you have any back difficulties, any back pain, even if it's in your IT band in your leg. My man, Dr. Adam Maddox, is the best in the business. Special guest time at Off the Crossbar. <laughs> Miz, let me ask you something. You coach in high school. True. Is there enough high school coverage? I would say it's getting better. Do you know why it's getting better? I'm going to guess, but I'm going to let you tell me. I'm going to say it's getting better because there's people out there that recognize that there's so much to cover. So what do they do? They get off their duff. They go out. They send guys to the games. They videotape games. They promote the players, and they make it a great experience for high school. And, and it's not just soccer, but uh, soccer is a big part of this guy's site. Uh, they do football, basketball, you name it, they do it. And they do it really well. So why don't you tell me, Miz, and tell the studio audience of over 500 who we got today. Uh, we have Gary Adornado of Varsity Sports Network joining us today to tell us about his website, his social media platform, and all the things that he's doing to cover high school sports. Very excited. So bring him up, Gary Adornado. What's up, brother? How are you? How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Absolutely our pleasure. Gary, tell us a little bit about the background of your site, because it is an awesome site. Okay, well, Varsity Sports Network, uh, this school year is our 10th anniversary year. So we've actually Ooh. been doing this 10 years, believe it or not. Uh, it started, uh, you know, 
you never know where your career is going to go. But I, in college, I got the fortunate opportunity to work at the, in the sports department at the Sun Papers. Did a lot of high school sports then, and then went off after I graduated into my career in marketing. And around uh, 2000, I started a, a sports-oriented marketing company with a partner. And one of the clients we picked up at that time was the MIAA, the, the private right. school league. We were doing their website for them and doing some sports marketing. Long, it's, it's a long story with a lot of details that I won't bore you with. But eventually, that site got sold to a company called Digital Sports, right. which was looking to do this all across the country. And they used my site as a model for what they were building. We had phenomenal success in Baltimore. They gave me some budget, and I was able to hire away all the top local sports writers from the papers. And we were covering the entire Baltimore marketplace. The when the economy collapsed in 2008, when all the banks right. were going under Wall Street, digital sports dream of doing this nationwide kind of faded. And mm. I left, and uh, some investors who were involved with our site as uh, advertisers at the time, had kids playing local sports, wanted to see it continue. And they uh, got to me, and they said, why don't you consider doing it? So looked into it. Started Varsity Sports Network and uh, love it. And as you say, we do all sports. Uh, from we've covered everything from badminton and squash to the biggest sports football. We co try to cover all the schools in the metro area, everywhere from um, Carroll, uh, um, Cecil County up in the north, and uh, down through uh, Hartford and Baltimore, the private school leagues, Howard County, Anne Arundel County, through, so the entire metropolitan footprint of Baltimore, and we boys and girls. Uh, and all sports, all seasons. You know what amazes me is there are games going on every day. And it's not just soccer, but the biggest games, always there. Like, I don't know that you've really ever missed a big game at Perry Hall. Like, you've, our biggest games, you've been there. And, and now, granted, some of them were championship games or rivalry games and state playoff games, what have you. But... Someone is always there, and that, that blows my mind that you can choose the right games to be at. How do you, how do you manage it all? Well, it, we follow it. We see what's coming up. We try to figure out what's the best games. But the important thing that we do, and you guys participate in this as coaches, is if we're not at the game, the coaches, we believe, have become educated to know that, hey, if we send our box score, if we – you know, if one of our parents sends a photo, Varsity Sports Network will still cover it. They'll still right. put it on the site. No organization, and we're a small organization, could be at every game. I mean, we cover 150 schools, and, and think each sports season, the fall, winter, and the spring, most of those schools have five or six varsity teams, sure. boys and girls. No one could be at every game. Yet, we believe that it's as much as possible, we want to give recognition to all those kids. So. Yeah, on Friday night, if we're at your game, we're writing that story. It's posted a couple hours later. But we'll work all day Saturday and all day Sunday and even Monday to post some stuff on the bigger games that we know happened if we, if we can get the information. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I noticed, like, over the last few years especially, as, as I'm watching your company grow, you're kind of like, you have reporters that are niche guys and girls, so they're, you know, this guy follows soccer and this guy follows football and this, like, how do you determine that? And, and how many people do you determine are needed for each sport? So most of my guys are freelancers. So okay. they're paid on a per assignment basis. So if, if when we get down to the playoffs, I have people that I bring in everywhere. And, the, you know, sometimes we, if we find a good, kid that works on the school newspaper and he wants to cover a certain school, we'll use him. Um, but it, it's, we got, got great guys like Joe de Blasi. Yeah. He does uh, mostly the pro MIA, but he's out at all the soccer games. And Nelson Kaufman, who's very good with Baltimore County, all sports. Um, just this week, we announced uh, Catherine Dunn. Um, from, uh, she retired <coughs> from the Sun Papers last year. She's going to begin contributing. Of course, Derek Tony is my right hand man. Derek's been around covering high school sports. Does a great job. As long as I've yep. been. Um, and Pat O'Malley gets involved with baseball. And, and there are other people that uh, that are on call to us that we, we use on a 
as needed basis. What I mean, just based on, and I know there's no probably way to collect hard data, but I'm just curious, like probably football, but what sport do you think garners the most like attraction from viewers? Well, we can follow it a little bit. So football obviously is tremendous, but it's only one day a week. So when you look at the views we get for soccer, your team's played two, maybe three times a week. Right. Uh, so that is filling the pages up through, all throughout the week. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, our, our cycle is kind of neat. It, you'll see the traffic kind of peak towards the middle end of the fall season. Then it dips a little bit. And then basketball, because basketball literally goes seven oh, yeah. days a week. Those teams right. are playing four and five games. So it'll peak again. And we have a big audience for wrestling. And then in the spring, because lacrosse is so big here, uh, we get a national audience because people were following right, um, the right. MIA league. But baseball and um, softball, they're all big attractions. So spring is actually when we have the most people looking at our site uh, wow. for whatever reason. And I think it's just more volume of sports going on at that time of year. Yeah. And then the added people that come around for lacrosse. I would have thought fall, but... If football was seven days a week, it would probably be <laughs> really? the biggest, yeah. Well, you, we live in an area where soccer in the fall is just spectacular. I mean, I, honestly, I, I, I can't think of any place in the country that has the high school soccer rivalries that, that match some football rivalries. Like, I've been to a lot of football games in high school, and I don't know that I've ever seen a crowd that draws as much as Curly Calvert Hall, for example. Yeah. You know, um, do, do you find that those games are like marquee games? And, and if so, what are the best, in your opinion, high school rivalries? Well, uh, uh, that's obviously one of the very best right there. Uh, and then McDonough with, this, with those same schools, uh, and they have a big rivalry with Gilman in the county. You guys, you know, Delaney is yeah. a great rivalry. Absolutely. Uh, Eastern Tech and mm -hmm. Perry Hall and what have you. Uh, and then Anne Arundel County, you have uh, Severna Park and Broadneck and uh, up here in Hartford County, C. Milton Wright and Bel Air. So sure. there's so many natural rivals. And, and I think those rivalries are, are born out of the fact that the kids from the schools grow up playing together in the rec programs and the club teams. And then they may filter off, but they, they have long standing relationships. The coaches, the alumni, like you referred to the 3,000 people that were at the Calvert Hall Curly soccer game. And it might have been more. I yeah. mean, that was a mob scene. That yeah. was crazy the other so, night. So they do a real good job of promoting that to their students. Those two schools actually play the Reef Cup every year. That wasn't actually the Reef Cup because they alternate it this year. Right. It's actually a Curly. I think Curly's bringing in portable lights for that game, so that'll be a night game as well. Um, you're right. And, and you talk in your earlier segment about Adam's club team, that's a uh, common place in this area where at all age levels, Baltimore is out competing for or winning national soccer championships. Sure. So obviously the level of soccer in this area is, is higher than a lot of metro areas. We had a, we had a winner, Val's uh, 2001 premier team, yeah. Coppermine. They, yeah. they, they won a national championship. And there were other teams there, a couple of Pipeline girls teams. And, and girls team win, Pipeline believe, boys yeah. won. Right. Yeah. Right. It is a it is a just hotbed for the national scene, but it's amazing how the the club teams are so good, and then they break up and then they play high school and these kids that are best friends go at it tooth and nail. Sure, I love the high school soccer atmosphere. Absolutely love it. Um, what are what is your favorite high school game? Well, I. I'm a baseball guy, so as far as a writer. Okay, I, I, let's pretend this is a <laughs> soccer show. <laughs> All right, and let's say, what is your favorite high soccer, school soccer game to cover? Oh, favorite high, I, I thought you meant what is my favorite soccer Yeah, I don't game. want you to go talk about Severna Park beating Mead and Badminton. I'd like to know something about yeah, soccer. It's, it's a great matchup, though. It, it is. There was, they go at it with, with, I have not seen a shuttlecock hit that hard in my life. <laughs> So I, I've seen almost every state championship game in the last four or five years, and I've seen every MIA championship game. Those are my favorite games, I, regardless of who the teams are, because the everything's on the line. Yeah. And and the competition is 
it's it's so amazing. And the kids, a lot of those games go to double overtime and shootouts. Right. And, sure. Um, that's what I really, as a as a writer, like to go cover. Anyone stand out in your mind? Your your team that won the state championship was an amazing team to watch. Uh, the, I I lived in Perry Hall at the time, and then right. then to see you guys win. And then the following year, the girls followed through. And uh, the, girls got to the final. The girls won it last year. Right, they did. Um, so, greatest soccer game I saw uh, may have been the uh, Curly Calvert Hall championship game from three years ago. Oh, okay. Where Curly, Curly had a one to nothing lead, mm -hmm. missed a couple open nets, and... Uh, Created, opened the door and Calvert Hall came back and we were just talking about that game yeah. uh, there was the one in Anne Arundel County yes, correct at the yeah college yeah great game absolutely fantastic uh, it, it, one of the ones that I think you know now you look at you look at that curly Calvert Hall rivalry that's one for the books for sure absolutely and there was a game at Goucher College several years ago where McDonough was number one in the country had not lost the game locally, right? And they get upset by Loyola. I remember that and, as well. And that was a stunner. Um, yeah. That was, uh, if I remember, that's like Sean Clark and Shane McWilliams were on that team, and then they had uh, they had uh, I think those kids might have been juniors at the time, and they had a really strong senior class, if I recall. Uh, yeah, they went undefeated the following year. So if they had won that game, they go undefeated two straight years. Yeah. Well, that was unbelievable. That's that's great, and we can't thank you enough for covering what you do and doing what you do. I appreciate it. it we do it for the kids. Uh, uh, Adam had mentioned we're a subscription site, so it's four dollars and ninety nine cents a month. Uh, you pay more than that for a cup of coffee in the daytime, and right. I think the newspaper costs you over a dollar a day. And we have all the schedules, standings, and scores. That's all free. You don't have to pay to, to see that stuff. Uh, and we have really dedicated guys going out and just bring some uh, exposure to the kids. We'll never do a negative story, and we know things happen out there where kids get in trouble. That's not our our domain. We right. want to focus on the positive, we want to cover the games, and tell great future stories. Now, I have a question. So how do you, as, as the entity you are, convince a parent who might think, well, I wouldn't mind paying the $5 a month or whatever it is for the subscription, but they're never going to mention my Ashley or my Joey. Like, so how do you convince that parent that, hey, look, if everybody buys in, you know, then we would have more budget to get more people, and then eventually that will spill over, and yes, your son or daughter would be covered. You know, like, how do you convince well, people? Well, that? obviously, that's what I would tell them is the more we grow, the more we can cover, and... Uh, I, I would encourage anyone, whether I was talking to them about subscribing or not, to speak to their coaches, to, mm. to encourage uh, people to participate. We don't necessarily like to take content from parents just because sometimes it can sure. be biased, but there have been instances where I've gotten to know people and they're trusted, and I do um, rely on them for information. Uh, and. I, I never twist anyone's arm. I, I, the site is what it is. We do the best we can. And uh, w when we talk to sponsors, it's the same thing. Their, their sponsorship money, yes, we have a great audience that they, they get to be uh, have access to, but they are supporting the coverage of high school sports. That's what it comes down to. Um, we're not a big media machine. We're not the son that owns seven newspapers, and, but we do the best we can. And uh, if something is brought to our attention, we'll do our very best to uh, put it on our site. Well, you guys do a fantastic job. And, uh, Unbelievable. I, I Honestly, so, the, so could you tell our studio audience of over 500 people, where can we find you? VarsitySportsNetwork.com uh, on the Internet. Or uh, we also have a page on Facebook and Twitter and all, all the other social media. Uh, just go to our site. You'll, you'll see the pages. They just All the articles are right there in front of you, and you won't engage the paywall unless you actually try to open an article to read, and then it'll ask you to subscribe. You can get your first month for $0.49, cents, and then it renews, and you can cancel at any time. Uh, we also have models where there isn't a renewing. You can sign up for a month or a 
three month period for a little higher premium of a price, but it expires whenever your time is to up. To cover your season. Yeah, to cover your season, three months at a time. Um, people can even get the, the price is even cheaper for the subscription if you pay for six months or a year. A subscription for a year is uh, $49.99, which is $20 off you pay at $5 a month. So. so go to this site. If you have a kid playing high school sports, go to and don't be a cheap ass. Because they can't, they catch you. Because I know, because I'm a cheap ass. And what well, somebody will put up on Facebook, somebody beats somebody, and I'll click the article, and you get to, you get enough to read three sentences. And then it goes, you got to pay for it. Well, I, Don't I, be a cheap ass. Read the article. The other thing is, and I apologize, I got a nasty gram the other day from Varsity Sports Network because I tried to go on and log in, and they kicked back, and it said, oh, you're, you know, your subscription has been That's canceled. That's automated. But <laughs> what happened was... I, my credit card got hijacked, so I had to get a new one, and then I just forgot to go in and change the, the payment information. So I apologize I, for that. I hope it wasn't a nasty gram. We tried yeah, to be polite. I mean, it was on the fence, but <laughs> no, nah, it wasn't. And I'm sorry about stealing your credit card. I was at the beach. Right. It was hopping. You needed a new uh, hopping. hammock, right? All right, Gary, thank you thank so you. much for coming, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. All right, thank you. Go to the site. We are off the crossbar. Crazy, crazy game the other night, Miz. That's one word for it. Crazy. And off the crossbar, one coach is not real happy about the U.S. men's national team. How's the other coach feel about it? Make it two. Holy cow. What is going on? A 3 nothing loss to Mexico. It was horrible. It's not just the score line. Like, if you... If you watch the game and you, you see us doing all these things and we just struggle to finish and maybe just caught some bad breaks on the other end and it finished 3-0, it happens sometimes. You can stomach it. Uh, it's not fun, but um, you can digest that a lot easier than what we, would, what we witnessed the other night. And when you play Mexico in the current environment, it's, if you let them get their teeth into the game, it's like being in freaking Mexico. I mean, it sounded like it was 75, 25 Mexican fans. But, but the, the, the problem was, we're not doing anything to get the American fans loud. And, you know, Greg, good, 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 bird halter uh, said, you know, this is, we're, we're getting better. This is, we're developing talent. We're getting better. We're, do you see that when you watch us play? Um, I see some of the younger guys maybe getting better a little bit, but just by better meaning that they'll make a few more plays than they did in the game before. Um, but when you're talking about getting better, that should mean that when you look at it and you're giving it the old eyeball test, we should look like the flow is better and our system is better and we play with purpose and we know exactly what we're doing and to me, I don't see that. I see a bunch of station-to-station -station stuff and trying to just, like, figure it out as we go along. And, and the other teams see it, too, and they're not dumb, and they just defend us. It's easy. It looked like to me that Mexico definitely had a game plan to go down and attack our left side. Before they got the goal, which came from the left side, they attacked it seven times, getting in behind the back, on almost the same play, seven times. And we, we were lucky it wasn't one nothing much sooner. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's, there's, no, there's no science in that. It takes five seconds to see, like, okay, here's our key to get in. You know, here's the back we're going to try to attack because these other guys might be stronger or, you know, they might be better 1v1 defenders or whatever. So here's our, here's our, our key to get in. So it's just, hey, you – Go at this guy. Just get the ball over here and go at this guy. Go at this guy. And eventually, they're going to break it, which they did. They I mean, did. not only did they get by one, the guy did one guy up and then meg the other guy and then, you know, slid it across into the box in the air where there were three guys eating lunch and any one of them could have put it in. And unfortunately, it was Ch Chicharito, but it wouldn't have mattered. Someone would have tapped it in. What bothers me is, number one, fundamental principles of defending stop that problem from happening. Correct. Right, and it, let's let's say, for example, that guy makes a spectacular play, gets behind our back, cuts it back. That happens. Spectacular plays happen from spectacular players, and if you're at that level, you should be a spectacular player. However, seven times, 
and there was no adjustment, no flow of the game, no substitution to say, hey, maybe we got to do something different here with a different guy. Granted, it's an exhibition. Still, it hurts. Talk about three guys off the serve, unmarked, within 10 yards of the goal. Ball watching. <laughs> well, <they're, laughs> I mean, that's what that is. It's the whole defending, you know, ooh and an ah and over this guy doing his thing out wide. And they're ball watching, waiting to see what he's going to do. And no one's head on a swivel looking at marks. And everyone got stuck ball watching. Chicharito, maybe the best goal scorer in Mexican history, had no one around him. No, no one around him. No, none. Could have been. I mean, could have changed the game. So that's problem number one that I saw is our left side was absolutely awful. But like you said, and I mean, like you said, it's not that that was the only play. And sometimes, like, teams score goals and it's just a great offensive play. Right. That was one of them. It was a great individual effort by the winger. But um, they were getting – you could see it coming because – it was like, hey, let's go here once, twice, three, th- and it's like, okay, once you see, all right, here's what they're trying to do, where's the adjustment? It was, a, it was watching a boxing match where someone's just throwing haymakers with their right hand, and just because you've blocked six of them in a row doesn't mean the seventh one is getting through. It's you know, sting you got eventually. lucky, you got lucky right. on the first seven, and then whack. How about, what are your feelings on, and, and, and again, I'm a fan, I'm a fan of United States soccer, so I hate to say this, and, and like seriously, probably an, an awesome guy and an awesome goalkeeper, but talk to me a little bit about Zach Steffen and the ball distribution with his feet. Just a bad decision, um, and you know you expect guys at that level, and and you know is it that commonplace for him? No, but he's made some some quirky decisions in the past, and it's like you know it's kind of getting in the neighborhood of common for him to to make those mistakes. And so for as great as a shot blocker he is, great shot blocker. Yeah, I mean he's top he's he's top class, but if if you're, you're struggling to get the ball to your teammates after you make the save, then uh, it, might, it just kind of eliminates what you're doing to make the great plays. So the second goal for Mexico comes because the ball's played into Zach Steffen, who tries to distribute it up the middle, which, number one, probably in that situation was the exact wrong decision because there was high pressure. But number two, an inaccurate pass, not just a foot or two, Maybe maybe three to five yards inaccurate right to an attacking player. Before you know it, we're getting a pitchfork and digging the ball out of the net. Yeah. You know, they were I, waiting for that. I mean, the, the, the attackers were waiting for it. But he, he did it a couple times earlier in the game where it was a bad giveaway. I've seen it, I think it was a, in against El Salvador, where we gave the ball away a lot. My question is, at some point, can there be someone who just says, when in doubt, get it out? Is that still a thing at the, at the international level? Is, does it make sense, or do you have to go with this, we are, we are going to play it out of the back, and we are going to... Well, you, we don't know what's being said in the locker room. We yeah, don't know, that's uh, a good point. It, it could be a situation where, hey, look, no matter, we're going to take our lumps, but this is what we're going to play. We're sticking to it. Uh, We're committed to this design of our schematic layout, and uh, the ball's going to go here, there, or whatever, and if they do this, then we should do this. And uh, you expect, no matter what, like, guys should be able to handle the ball, guys should be able to distribute the ball in good areas, especially coming out of the back. I mean, that's, it's key. Uh, If you can't do that, it's going to be tough for you. We almost gave away one earlier with bad decisions in the back where we just gave it away inside our own box yeah. in the first half. I think it was maybe 20 minutes in, and, and it could have been, could have been uh, uh, 2 nothing very quickly. Um, one question I have for you regarding the U.S. men's national team. When I was a kid, there was no hope for the United States to get to the World Cup. I don't even know if we had a national team when I was starting to find out about international soccer, which would have been 82, 86. 90, I think, was Italy, and we qualified. Didn't win a game. Hosted in 94. 
and we beat Colombia, which was huge. And we ended up advancing. We lost to Brazil, Brazil yeah. on the 4th of July. Great game, by the way. We played very tough. But yeah. We, you know, we competed in that game. From that point on, you saw a rise in U.S. international soccer that has come to a screeching and painful halt where I don't know if this team, I don't know if we're on track. I look at one moment and wonder how much impact this has. U.S. soccer decided to shut down the U.S. men's national camp in Bradenton, Florida. Since that time, we focused all of our energy on the Development Academy, and we've done more poorly. Your opinion, is that a big move? I, I feel like that move hurt us a lot, um, but I don't feel like that was the end all. For me, it's, it's real simple. It's player selection. Like, we, we spoke about this before. Uh, and all the, the, the people that play soccer in the United States, I just, unless someone convinces me otherwise with some kind of crazy scientific data, I just don't believe that we can't find 11 to 15 guys on the men's team. We figured it out on the girls, but on the men's team, that can compete against anyone. And I don't care how they play. I don't care the style they play. I don't care the skill level they have. Like, for me, it, it should be pretty simple to find those guys. What, you know, even will it take a few years to do it? Sure. Well, we've been at it for a long time, and we still can't figure it out. I mean, even taking us back to some of the better teams that we've had where we got into the deep into the World Cup and right. you know, unfortunate loss to Germany and all that, I really liked our team that year. But, again, it, was, it wasn't a collection of marquee players. It wasn't some kind of crazy system they were playing. It was just – Players who work well together, players who understood, you know, to, to work hard for the greater good. And um, it, it just, I don't know, I, I, I just shake my head at it. And, and hopefully one day, and look, it could be Greg G -G 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 who does it, I don't know. Uh, but hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, we figure it out. It's just painful to watch. I just, it just really, really is disheartening. Because I'm a fan. I and, am and too. I, I live and die with it. And I want to see us do well. Me too. But I, I mean, what do you, my so what do you, do you think the Bradenton move uh, was, was catastrophic for our, our men's team? You know, I wouldn't go so far as to say catastrophic. But one of the things Christian Pulisic said in an interview after the game was something to the effect of, we, it's hard to play this system when you're only training a couple weeks out of the year together. If you have a core group playing that system over time, building chemistry, building a rapport, it makes it a lot easier. And it makes it easier now that you're giving guys, now obviously he's not a guy that would live in Bradenton, Florida because he's getting paid big money to be in England, but you can always bring in those ones and twos and threes and fours to, to fit in, Better and they world should world. be good enough to fit into a system and enhance it. So was your interpretation of that statement that Greg G -G -G needs to simplify the system? Either the team needs more time together, or you need to simplify it, or do something to build a rapport because what you've done now isn't working. And it seems to be backsliding. Like, I thought Klinsman had it and lost it. Then I think after him was Bruce Arena, correct? Mm -hmm. Short stint again. Yeah, and just couldn't get out of his own way. Now we're at Greg Berhalter, and it's not. You know, he had a couple good games in there, but overall... Not the results we're looking for, and it's not just the results, it's the way we're losing. It is, it is a thumping. It looks bad. Optically, it just says to me, we're, we're sliding backwards. We used to dominate CONCACAF. We don't anymore. Yeah, and everyone else is getting better, and you know, smaller countries with way less people have figured out how to find the best players that they can find, and we struggle to find that. Are they getting better? Because I don't see teams from CONCACAF, aside from Mexico 
I think Costa Rica had a nice run once. But you're not seeing a lot of these teams go on to do great things outside of CONCACAF. I think we have backslid into a position where we're just one of these other countries with a lot more money and a lot more resources, and we brag about our academies and blah, blah, blah. Well, I would say to that, uh, big picture, probably, you know, are they getting better? Maybe not, but I would say within CONCACAF, I would say yes. I mean, typically those teams used to get, you know, destroyed five, six, seven, nothing, and it wasn't even, you know, the other teams weren't breaking a sweat. Mexico, U.S., um, and, and some of the other teams Jamaica that are was in tough. There, yeah, they were they were all tough. But now, I mean, you know, the smaller countries that are in within Concacaf, they're they're making competitive games. Now, do they eventually call you know make a mistake that that forfeits the game for them, um, or concedes the game rather? Yeah, they do. And you typically kind of wait around for that to happen. But I feel like they're they're not making those mistakes they used to in the games. You know, the, the score lines aren't as, as different as they, as they used to be. What happened to the U.S. striker? When's the last time we had a bona fide striker that, that wins head balls in the box? Well, that we finishes sunk a chances. lot of investment, time, money, and whatever resources on out the door, and maybe it's time for him to go out the door. You know what I mean? I don't know. I mean, do we... Good. You're on a roll. Uh, you are on that. It's two oh, and one the show. comedy factor! That two man is one, on I mean, fire! Two and one show. It's unbelievable, right? Um, but yeah, I, there's there's got a lot of talk about the Sergeant kids, so we'll see what happens with him. And um, Morris does well when he's in, but they kind of have been playing him playing wider. Playing wide. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, depends on what happens. So I just... I hope it turns around, Miz. Me too. I really do. I am not the most optimistic fellow, however. But prove me wrong, U.S. national team, please. I'm your number one fan. Get it together. Speaking of getting together. Let's get it together. Favorite part of the show, right here. I'm pumped. Favorite part of the show. What are we talking about? We are talking about none other than the Patrick Swayze Player of the Week. Patrick Swayze, what can you say about his acting talent? By the way, just had a documentary on a few weeks ago. Watched it. Unbelievable. I had no idea. His nickname was Buddy. I didn't know that either. Yeah, they, they, everyone in the show called him Buddy. You know, hey, Buddy this and Buddy that. I was like, okay. I tell you what, though, it was sad. Very sad. Very sad. I'm sure there were a lot of Kleenexes uh, that handed out by the ladies and uh, just... Very sad. No doubt. However, his hair stands the test of time. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Best hair ever. Um, and, and, and in his acting, no one could have said, be nice until it's not, or be nice until it's time, time to not, not be, be nice the way he did. He was, mean, also, he was also a ballet dancer. His mom taught ballet and all that, and that's how he became such a great dancer. He danced in every movie. He did movie. it all. He did all of his own stunts in, in uh, Point Break. He jumped out of the plane every day before shoots until he became comfortable enough to, to do uh, Man, it was unbelievable. He was also, he also, when he did the little flip off the fence in the Outsiders, graceful as can be, hair did not move. Uh, hair was incredible. Yeah. I would actually... I would actually, you know, I would actually karate kick a priest to get that hair. Well, and credit to the L.A. Looks Gel Company back in the 80s who was, you know, they would make such a product that you put it in and it just didn't move. I think part of the reasons why they don't do that anymore is because I'm out of business. Because I used to gel this mullet up like nobody's business. Anyway, so we have the Patrick Swayze mullet. Who gets the award this year, this week? Well, there was a huge upset in the soccer world. Huge! Um, between two MIAA teams, uh, one just happens to be ranked number one. Uh, and, you know, was it a game where they maybe just didn't, you know, had a bad day at the office, so to speak? Probably. Or were they looking past it? Could have been. Could have been. Either way. Uh, but credit to Spalding. They came, they, they came out. With uh, probably nothing to lose, you know that mentality makes you always dangerous, um, and they were able to get a goal and and upset McDonough, so it was huge. The man of the hour scored a big goal against Severn, comes back, scores the game winner against number one ranked McDonough. 
we are giving the Patrick Swayze Player of the Week to none other than Luca Mazzola. What a great name, isn't it? Luca Mazzola. You're either going to be a chef or a soccer player. You're, you're pretty much, at that point, 99.9% .9 you have to be Italian. Yeah, yeah, there's no question. So, my man, have some pasta. Enjoy it. Look at that mullet. You look great, kid. We are off the crossbar. I am the coach, Pete Eibner. This is the co-coach, Adam the Miz Mizell. We are signing off. Catch up with us next week because we got a banger of a show.